Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Before we begin tonight's podcast, just a couple of things. First, to the thousands of you around the globe who tune in every week, hi. That's it. Just hi. I hope you're well. Second, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to our latest Patreon member, Beth. Beth, thank you so much for your support of this podcast. It helps make it possible for everyone, and it's much appreciated. Now, let's get to the reading. This evening, we're relaxing with Science Primers, an introductory, by Professor Thomas Henry Huxley, first published in 1880 by Macmillan and Co., London. Let's begin. Part 1. Nature and Science 1. Sensations and Things All the time that we are awake, we are learning by means of our senses something about the world in which we live and of which we form a part. We are constantly aware of feeling or hearing or smelling, and unless we happen to be in the dark, of seeing. At intervals we taste. We call the information thus obtained sensation. When we have any of these sensations, We commonly say that we feel, or hear, or smell, or see, or taste something. A certain scent makes us say we smell onions, a certain flavor that we taste apples, a certain sound that we hear a carriage, a certain appearance before our eyes that we see a tree and we call that which we thus perceive by the aid of our senses a thing or an object. 2. Causes and Effects Moreover, we say of all these things or objects that they are the causes of the sensations in question and that the sensations are the effects of these causes. For example, if we hear a certain sound, we say it is caused by a carriage going along the road, or that it is the effect or the consequence of a carriage passing along. If there is a strong smell of burning, we believe it to be the effect of something on fire, and to look about anxiously for the cause of the smell If we see a tree, we believe that there is a thing or object which is the cause of that appearance in our field of view. 3. The Reason Why Explanation In the case of the smell of burning, when we find on looking about that something actually is on fire, We say indifferently either that we have found out the cause of the smell or that we know the reason why we perceive that smell or that we have explained it. So that to know the reason why of anything or to explain it is to know the cause of it. But that which is the cause of one thing is the effect of another. Thus, suppose we find some smoldering straw 
to be the cause of the smell of burning. We immediately ask what set it on fire, or what is the cause of its burning. Perhaps we find that a lighted Lucifer match has been thrown into the straw, and then we say that the lighted match was the cause of the fire. But a Lucifer match would not be in that place unless some person had put it there. That is to say, the presence of the Lucifer match is an effect produced by somebody as cause. So we ask, why did anyone put the match there? Was it done carelessly? Or did the person who put it there intend to do so? And if so, what was his motive, or the cause which led him to do such a thing? And what was the reason of his having such a motive? It is plain that there is no end to the questions, one arising out of the other, that might be asked in this fashion. Thus we believe that everything is the effect of something which preceded it as its cause, and that this cause is the effect of something else, and so on, through a chain of causes and effects which goes back as far as we choose to follow it. Anything is said to be explained as soon as we have discovered its cause, or the reason why it exists. The explanation is fuller if we can find out the cause of that cause. And the further we can trace the chain of causes and effects, the more satisfactory is the explanation. But no explanation of anything can be complete, because human knowledge, at its best, goes but a very little way back towards the beginning of things. 4. Properties and Powers When a thing is found always to cause a particular effect, we call that effect sometimes a property, sometimes a power of the thing. Thus, the odor of onions is said to be a property of onions, because onions always cause that particular sensation of smell to arise when they are brought near the nose. Lead is said to have the property of heaviness, because it always causes us to have the feeling of weight when we handle it. A stream is said to have the power to turn a water wheel because it causes the water wheel to turn. And a venomous snake is said to have the power to kill a man because its bite may cause a man to die. Properties and powers, then, are certain effects caused by the things which are said to possess them. 5. Artificial and Natural Objects A great many of the things brought to our knowledge by our senses, such as houses and furniture, carriages and machines, are termed artificial things or objects because they have been shaped by the art of man. Indeed, they are generally said to be made by man. But a far greater number of things owe nothing to the hand of man, and would be just what they are if mankind did not exist, such as the sky and the clouds, the sun, moon, and stars, the sea with its rocks and shingly or sandy shores, the hills and dales of the land, and all wild plants and animals. Things of this kind are termed natural objects, and to the whole of them we give the name of nature. 
Six. Artificial things are only natural things, shaped and brought together or separated by men. Although this distinction between nature and art, between natural and artificial things, is very easily made and very convenient, it is needful to remember that in the long run, we owe everything to nature. That even those artificial objects, which we commonly say are made by men, are only natural objects shaped and moved by men, and that in the sense of creating, that is to say, of causing something to exist which did not exist in some other shape before, man can make nothing whatever. Moreover, we must recollect that what men do in the way of shaping and bringing together or separating natural objects is done in virtue of the powers which they themselves possess as natural objects. Artificial things are, in fact, all produced by the action of that part of nature which we call mankind upon the rest. We talk of making a box, and rightly enough, if we mean only that we have shaped the pieces of wood and nailed them together. But the wood is a natural object, and so is the iron of the nails. A watch is made of the natural objects gold and other metals, sand, soda, rubies, brought together and shaped in various ways. A coat is made of the natural object wool, and a frock of the natural objects cotton or silk. Moreover, the men who make all these things are natural objects. Carpenters, builders, shoemakers, and all other artisans and artists are persons who have learned so much of the powers and properties of certain natural objects, and of the chain of causes and effects in nature, as enables them to shape and put together those natural objects, so as to make them useful to man. A carpenter could not, as we say, make a chair, unless he knew something of the properties and powers of wood. A blacksmith could not make a horseshoe, unless he knew that it is a property of iron to become soft and easily hammered into shape when it is made red-hot. A brickmaker must know many of the properties of clay, and a plumber could not do his work unless he knew that lead has the properties of softness and flexibility, and that a moderate heat causes it to melt. So that the practice of every art implies a certain knowledge of natural causes and effects, and the improvement of the arts depends upon our learning more and more of the properties and powers of natural objects, and discovering how to turn the properties and the powers of things, and the connections of cause and effect among them, to our own advantage. 7. Many objects and chains of causes and effects in nature are out of our reach. Among natural objects, as we have seen, there are some that we can get hold of and turn to account, but all the greatest things in nature, and the links of cause and effect which connect them, are utterly beyond our reach. The sun rises and sets, the moon and the stars move through the sky, fine weather and storms, Cold and heat alternate. The sea changes from violent disturbance to glassy calm, as the winds sweep over it with varying strength or die away. 
innumerable plants and animals come in being and vanish again, without our being able to exert the slightest influence on the majestic procession of the series of great natural events. Hurricanes ravage one spot, earthquakes destroy another, volcanic eruptions lay waste a third. A fine season scatters wealth and abundance here, and a long drought brings pestilence and famine there. In all such cases, the direct influence of man avails him nothing, and so long as he is ignorant, he is the mere sport of the greater powers of nature. 8. The Order of Nature Nothing happens by accident, and there is no such thing as chance. But the first thing that men learned, as soon as they began to study nature carefully, was that some events take place in regular order, and that some causes always give rise to the same effects. The sun always rises on one side and sets on the other side of the sky. The changes of the moon follow one another in the same order and with similar intervals. Some stars never sink below the horizon of the place in which we live. The seasons are more or less regular. Water always flows downhill. Fire always burns. Plants grow up from seed and yield seed, from which like plants grow up again. Animals are born grow, reach maturity and die, age after age, in the same way. Thus the notion of an order of nature, and of a fixity in the relation of cause and effect between things, gradually entered the minds of men. So far as such order prevailed, it was felt that things were explained while the things that could not be explained were said to have come about by chance or to happen by accident. But the more carefully nature has been studied, the more widely has order been found to prevail, while what seemed disorder has proved to be nothing but complexity. Until at present, no one is so foolish as to believe that anything happens by chance, or that there are any real accidents, in the sense of events which have no cause. And if we say that a thing happens by chance, everybody admits that all we really mean is that we do not know its cause, or the reason why that particular thing happens. Chance and accident are only aliases of ignorance. At this present moment, as I look out of my window, it is raining and blowing hard, and the branches of the trees are waving wildly to and fro. It may be that a man has taken shelter under one of these trees. Perhaps, if a stronger gust than usual comes, a branch will break, fall upon the man, and seriously hurt him. If that happens, it will be called an accident, and the man will perhaps say that by chance he went out, and then chanced to take refuge under the tree, and so the accident happened but there is neither chance nor accident in the matter. The storm's the effect of causes operating upon the atmosphere, perhaps hundreds of miles away. Every vibration of a leaf is the consequence of the mechanical force of the wind acting on the surface exposed to it. If the bow breaks, 
it will do so in consequence of the relation between its strength and the force of the wind. If it falls upon the man, it will do so in consequence of the action of other definite natural causes, and the position of the man under it is only the last term in a series of causes and effects which have followed one another in natural order from that cause, the effect of which was his setting out, to that the effect of which was his stepping under the tree. But inasmuch as we are not wise enough to be able to unravel all these long and complicated series of causes and effects which lead to the falling of the branch upon the man, we call such an event an accident. 9. Laws of Nature Laws are not causes. When we have made out by careful and repeated observation that something is always the cause of a certain effect, or that certain events always take place in the same order, we speak of the truth thus discovered as a law of nature. Thus it is a law of nature that anything heavy falls to the ground if it is unsupported. It is a law of nature that under ordinary conditions, lead is soft and heavy, while flint is hard and brittle because experience shows us that heavy things always do fall if they are unsupported, that under ordinary conditions, lead is always soft, and that flint is always hard. In fact, everything that we know about the powers and properties of natural objects, and about the order of nature, may properly be termed a law of nature but it is desirable to remember that which is very often forgotten, that the laws of nature are not the causes of the order of nature, but only our way of stating as much as we have made out of that order. Stones do not fall to the ground in consequence of the law just stated, as people sometimes carelessly say, but the law is a way of asserting that which invariably happens when heavy bodies at the surface of the earth, stones among the rest, are free to move. The laws of nature are, in fact, in this respect, similar to the laws which men make for the guidance of their conduct towards one another. There are laws about the payment of taxes, and there are laws against stealing or murder. But the law is not the cause of a man's paying his taxes, nor is it the cause of his abstaining from theft and murder. The law is simply a statement of what will happen if he does not pay his taxes, and if he commits theft or murder. And the cause of his paying his taxes or abstaining from crime in the absence of any better motive is the fear of consequences, which is the effect of his belief in that statement. A law of man tells what we may expect society will do under certain circumstances, and a law of nature tells us what we may expect natural objects will do under certain circumstances. Each contains information addressed to our intelligence, and except so far as it influences our intelligence, it is merely so much sound or writing. While there is this much analogy between human and natural laws, however, certain essential differences between the two must not be overlooked. Human law consists of commands addressed to voluntary agents, which they may obey or disobey, 
and the law is not rendered null and void by being broken. Natural laws, on the other hand, are not commands, but assertions respecting the invariable order of nature, and they remain laws only so long as they can be shown to express that order. To speak of the violation or the suspension of a law of nature is an absurdity. All that the phrase can really mean is that under certain circumstances, the assertion contained in the law is not true, and the just conclusion is not that the order of nature is interrupted, but that we have made a mistake in stating that order. A true natural law is a universal rule, and as such, admits of no exceptions. Again, human laws have no meaning apart from the existence of human society. Natural laws express the general course of nature, of which human society forms only an insignificant fraction. 10. Knowledge of nature is the guide of practical conduct. If nothing happens by chance, but everything in nature follows a definite order, and if the laws of nature embody that which we have been able to learn about the order of nature in accurate language, then it becomes very important for us to know as many as we can of these laws of nature, in order that we may guide our conduct by them. Any man who should attempt to live in a country without reference to the laws of that country would very soon find himself in trouble. And if he were fined, imprisoned, or even hanged, sensible people would probably consider that he had earned his fate by his folly. In like manner, anyone who tries to live upon the face of this earth without attention to the laws of nature will live there for but a very short time, most of which will be passed in exceeding discomfort. A peculiarity of natural laws, as distinguished from those of human enactment, being that they take effect without summons or prosecution. Nobody could live for half a day unless he attended to some of the laws of nature. And thousands of us are dying daily or living miserably because men have not yet been sufficiently zealous to learn the code of nature. It has already been seen that the practice of all our arts and industries depends upon our knowing the properties of natural objects, which we can get hold of and put together, and though we may be able to exert no direct control over the greater natural objects and the general succession of causes and effects in nature, yet if we know the properties and powers of these objects, and the customary order of events, we may elude that which is injurious to us, and profit by that which is favorable. Thus, though men can no wise alter the seasons, or change the process of growth in plants, yet having learned the order of nature in these matters, they make arrangements for sowing and reaping accordingly. They cannot make the wind blow, but when it does blow, they take advantage of its known powers and probable direction to sail ships and turn windmills. They cannot arrest the lightning, but they can make it harmless by means of conductors the construction of which implies a knowledge of some of the laws of that electricity, of which lightning is one of the manifestations. Forewarned is forearmed, says the proverb, and knowledge of the laws of nature 
is forewarning of that which we may expect to happen when we have to deal with natural objects. 11. Science The knowledge of the laws of nature obtained by observation, experiment, and reasoning. No line can be drawn between common knowledge of things and scientific knowledge, nor between common reasoning and scientific reasoning. In strictness, all accurate knowledge is science, and all exact reasoning is scientific reasoning. The method of observation and experiment by which such great results are obtained in science is identically the same as that which is employed by everyone every day of his life, but refined and rendered precise. If a child acquires a new toy, he observes its character and experiments upon its properties, and we are all of us constantly making observations and experiments upon one thing or another. But those who have never tried to observe accurately will be surprised to find how difficult a business it is. There is not one person in a hundred who can describe the commonest occurrence with even an approach to accuracy. That is to say, either he will omit something which did occur and which is of importance, or he will imply or suggest the occurrence of something which he did not actually observe, but which he unconsciously infers must have happened. When two truthful witnesses contradict one another in a court of justice, it usually turns out that one or other, or sometimes both, are confounding their inferences from what they saw with what they actually saw. A swears that B picked his pocket. It turns out that all that A really knows is that he felt a hand in his pocket when B was close to him, and that B was not the thief, but C, whom A did not observe. Untrained observers mix up together their inferences from what they see with that which they actually see in the most wonderful way, and even experienced and careful observers are in constant danger of falling into the same error. Scientific observation is such as is at once full, precise, and free from unconscious inference. Experiment is the observation of that which happens when we intentionally bring natural objects together or separate them, or in any way change the conditions under which they are placed. Scientific experiment, therefore, is scientific observation performed under accurately known artificial conditions. It is a matter of common observation that water sometimes freezes. The observation becomes scientific when we ascertain under what exact conditions the change of water into ice takes place. The commonest experiments tell us that wood floats in water. Scientific experiment shows that in floating, it displaces its own weight of the water. Scientific reasoning differs from ordinary reasoning in just the same way as scientific observation and experiment differ from ordinary observation and experiment. That is to say, it strives to be accurate, and it is just as hard to reason accurately as it is to observe accurately. In scientific reasoning, general rules are collected from the observation of many particular cases, 
And when these general rules are established, conclusions are deduced from them, just as in everyday life. If a boy says that marbles are hard, he has drawn a conclusion as to marbles in general from the marbles he happens to have seen and felt, and has reasoned in that mode which is technically termed induction. If he declines to try to break a marble with his teeth, it is because he consciously or unconsciously performs the converse operation of deduction from the general rule, marbles are too hard to break with one's teeth. You will learn more about the process of reasoning when you study logic, which treats of that subject in full. At present, it is sufficient to know that the laws of nature are the general rules respecting the behavior of natural objects, which have been collected from innumerable observations and experiments, or, in other words, that they are inductions from those observations and experiments. The practical and theoretical results of science are the products of deductive reasoning from these general rules. Thus, science and common sense are not opposed, as people sometimes fancy them to be, but science is perfected common sense. Scientific reasoning is simply very careful common reasoning, and common knowledge grows into scientific knowledge as it becomes more and more exact and complete. The way to science, then, lies through common knowledge. We must extend that knowledge by careful observation and experiment, and learn how to state the results of our investigations accurately, in general rules or laws of nature. Finally, we must learn how to reason accurately from these rules, and thus arrive at rational explanations of natural phenomena which may suffice for our guidance in life. Part 2 Material Objects A. Mineral Bodies 12. The Natural Object Water one of the commonest of common natural objects is water. Everybody uses it in one way or another every day, and consequently, everybody possesses a store of loose information, of common knowledge, about it. But in all probability, a great deal of this knowledge has never been attended to by its possessor, and certainly those who have never tried to learn how much may be known about water will be ignorant of a great many of its powers and properties, and of the laws of nature which it illustrates, and consequently will be unable to account for many things of which the explanation is very easy. So, we may as well make a beginning of science by studying water. 13. A Tumbler of Water Suppose we have a tumbler half full of water. The tumbler is an artificial object. That is to say, certain natural objects have been brought together and heated till they melted into glass, and this glass has been shaped by a workman. The water, on the other hand, is a natural object, which has come from some river, pond, or spring. Or it may be from a water butt, into which the rain, which has fallen on the roof of a house, has flowed. 
Now the water has a vast number of peculiarities. For example, it is transparent so that you can see through it. It feels cool. It will quench thirst and dissolve sugar. But these are not the characters which it is most convenient to begin with. 14. Water occupies space. It offers resistance. It has weight and is able to transfer motion which it has acquired. It is therefore a form of matter. The water we see fills the cavity of the tumbler for half its height. Therefore, it occupies that much space, or has that bulk or volume. If you put the closed end of another tumbler of almost the same size into the first, you will find that when it reaches the water, the latter offers a resistance to its going down. And unless some of the water can get out, the end of the second tumbler will not go in. Anyone who falls from a height into water will find that he receives a severe shock when he reaches it. Water, therefore, offers resistance. If the water is emptied out, the tumbler feels much lighter than it was before. Water, therefore, has weight. And finally, if you throw the water out of the tumbler at any slightly supported object, the water hitting against it would knock it over. That is to say, the water being put in motion is able to transfer that motion to something else. All these phenomena, as things which happen in nature are often called, are effects of which water under the conditions mentioned, is the cause, and they may therefore be said to be properties of water. All things which occupy space, offer resistance, possess weight, and transfer motion to other things when they strike against them, are termed material substances or bodies, or simply matter. Water, therefore, is a kind or form of matter. 15. Water is a liquid. You will easily observe that though water occupies space, it has no definite shape, but fits itself exactly to the figure of the vessel which holds it. If the tumbler is cylindrical, the contour of the surface of the water will be circular when the tumbler is held vertically, and will change without the least break or interruption to more and more of an oval when the tumbler is inclined. And whatever the shape of the vessel into which you pour it, the sides of the water always exactly fit against the sides of the vessel. If you put your finger into the water, you can move it in all directions with scarcely any feeling of obstacle. If you pull your finger out, there is no hole left. The water on all sides rushing together to fill up the space that was occupied by the finger. You cannot take up a handful of water, for it runs away between your fingers and you cannot raise it into a permanent heap. All this shows that the parts of water move upon one another with great ease. The same fact is illustrated if the tumbler is inclined so that the level of the surface rises above the edge of the tumbler on one side, and the water is therefore to some extent unsupported by the tumbler at this point. The water then flows over in a stream 
and falls to the ground where it spreads out and runs to the lowest accessible place or gradually soaks up into crevices. Nevertheless, although the parts of the water thus loosely slip and slide upon one another, yet they hold together to a certain extent. If the surface of the water is just touched with the finger, a little of it will adhere, and if the finger is then slowly and carefully raised, the adjacent water will be raised up into a slender column which acquires a noticeable length before it breaks. So, in the early morning, after heavy dew, you may see the water upon cabbage leaves and blades of grass in spherical drops, the parts of which similarly hold together. Material substances, the parts of which are so movable that they fit themselves exactly to the sides of any vessel which contains them, and which flow when they are not supported, are called fluids. And fluids, the parts of which do not fly off from one another, but hold together as those of water do, are called liquids. Water, therefore, is a liquid. And with that bit of scientific revelation, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Science Primers, an introductory, by esteemed 19th century scientist Thomas Henry Huxley. That was one of the best explanations of the connection between scientific thinking and common knowledge that I've ever read will definitely be returning to this one. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook version from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If there's a book you'd like to hear read, contact me on our website at www.boringbookspod.com or catch me on Twitter at Boring Books Pod. I'd love to hear from you. I'm so glad you could join me this evening. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>